So the next group of topics we're going to talk about are the different types of herbal extracts you can use in practice. So based on the solvents that we talked about, the main ones that we use in practice is water, glycerol, ethanol, and oil. Um, now you can also do, there's something called variable, and I say that because there's a few different ways you can get solid extracts. But this is the main things that we're going to use uh, for the next few slides. So we're going to begin by talking about water extracts. Um, we're going to talk about teas and tinctures using alcohol and fluid extracts using alcohol. And then solid extracts uh, can be achieved by a few different ways where it becomes even more concentrated. The little images that I have here can show you the blue represents water. The little green dots represent how many little active phytochemicals are in there. So a cup of tea uh, is not nearly as concentrated as a tincture, which is a 1 to 4 extract, or a fluid extract, which is a 1 to 2 extract, or a solid extract, that's a 4 to 1 extract. So, depending on which one you choose, you may have to drink an entire cup of herbal tea, or you might only need to have a quarter of a teaspoon of a solid extract to get the same number of phytochemicals in there. Okay, so... So let's begin with, by discussing the water extracts. Now, when it comes to water, water is a great solvent when you're making teas. Hot water is better than cold water for extracting things like phenolic compounds and uh, tannins and other phytochemicals, okay? So the basic instruction is you typically take one or two teaspoons of uh, the dried herb, you add it to uh, a cup of hot water, and then you let it sit there. So you're not boiling it in the water, you add the hot water to it, you let it sit, you cover it up so if there's any essential oils like peppermint oil uh, will remain in there, because again, you're affecting the, uh, the pressure, so to speak. And then you let it steep for five or 10 or 15 minutes, and then you drink it. And this is a great way to extract leaves and flowers because um, they're relatively delicate plant material and so it's the kind of the easily kind of breaks it down and extracts the desired compounds when it comes to essential oils like for example peppermint does not peppermint oil the menthol it will not dissolve in the water but when you first make the cup there's peppermint little bubbles kind of flowing around in the water like separate in two phases and then eventually if it settles you'll see a biphasic layer where the peppermint oil will go to the top so you still are getting the peppermint oil or, or other essential oils out of making a tea um, even if it's not dissolving in the water per se okay so uh, this is great for polar compounds not too bad for essential oils um, where it's not great is if you have like large pieces of woody roots or bark, um, it's not going to be sufficient to extract uh, those compounds very well. Um, if you had like a piece of resin like from myrrh and a big big hard rock of it that you just threw in water and out, or threw in a glass of water and waited for a few minutes and drank it, you're not going to get all those terpenoids out of it very well. So it's not great for big chunks of hard, dense herbal material like barks and, and roots. It's not great for really resinous type of compounds. Uh, another disadvantage is people don't always like the taste of teas and they'd rather take it as a capsule. So chamomile, which a lot of people like the taste of, some people don't, so I can't get them to drink chamomile tea, okay? So the take home message here, this is great for leaves and flowers, delicate pieces. Uh, now as an aside, if someone had like cinnamon powder or, or ground ginger uh, in like a powder form, you could make a tea with it because it's been broken down enough and there's lots of surface area that you can extract it quickly with that. But not so good if you're having larger pieces, uh, like a big piece of ginger, you gotta, you gotta do a different preparation, okay? So there I am making a cup of chamomile tea. 
Now you got, we got some, I've made some little videos that'll make this kind of fun for you guys too. So that was a hot water infusion we discussed. So use hot water. Here's a cold water infusion. Now, cold water can be used to extract mucilage. And so I use this for psyllium, marshmallow, slippery elm root, where the desired compounds that you're trying to get out is a, um, a mucilage. Um, you'll get a little bit of the phenolics out, but not very much, relatively speaking. So, um, if for some reason you didn't want to extract the tannins from uh, a root, but you did want to get um, the mucilage out, then this would be a way you could do it. Now, the main instruction for it is you take, I generally use powders for this, where I'll take uh, a teaspoon of psyllium or one or two teaspoons of marshmallow root or psyllium or slippery elm, add it to water, and then shake it up, and then you just let it sit for a bit. Now, if it's a powder, it's gonna dissolve quite quickly. Um, you might let it sit for a couple minutes, or you might even drink it right away, depending on what you're trying to achieve. Um, in the case of psyllium, if I'm taking it as a fiber supplement, I probably would get the person to drink it right away. If I was using marshmallow root to help with heartburn, I'd shake it up and then let them sip it throughout the day. Um, so there's a lot of great advantage of this. It's cheap. Appreciate, you can buy a pound of marshmallow root or psyllium root for probably 10 bucks. Um, you can buy it in capsules as well, but very inexpensive way. And we have that in our clinic that we have a few of these things that we have in there. And patients, generally speaking, get good compliance. Most of the things I described don't have a lot of taste. Slippery elm, not everyone likes to taste, but uh, like I said, great for mucilage. Some people don't like the consistency of it. So for example, here's what psyllium looks like. A little bit viscous. That's one teaspoon per uh, cup of water there, okay? So how did I make it? Here's a little instructional video here. So sped it up. There's a teaspoon of psyllium with a cup of water and then I shake it up. So I sped it up just to be efficient here. Now, it's getting viscous already. I think I used two teaspoons there. Now watch. Uh, so this is after it sat for maybe 15 minutes. This is with two teaspoons of the psyllium. You can see it's really thickening up. Is getting pretty gloopy so this gets harder and harder to eat so in something like psyllium you probably want to sh if you're taking it for let's say constipation or diarrhea uh get them to do like one teaspoon per glass of water if you do more than that um it might just thicken up too much and become too chunky um also there was cases of not psyllium powder but psyllium husk which is uh the same thing just a different it's not hasn't been ground up that sometimes when people add it to water they don't mix it up thoroughly enough and it doesn't dissolve properly, it'll form like a big gelatinous glob that can get stuck in the esophagus and then start to expand and cause some choking. So um, just be aware of that. So there you had a couple different types of infusions. You had a hot water infusion and a cold water infusion. Now, a decoction, it's like a tea, but instead of adding hot water to the leaves and the flowers, what you're doing is you're boiling water and adding the herbs to it. And then you're letting it simmer for, could be 10, 15 minutes, or it could be hours, okay? Depending on what you're trying to achieve. So uh, what you're basically using this for is for the woody parts like roots, barks would be great, or rhizomes like ginger. Um, not as good for Things like um, essential oils. Uh, if you try to make peppermint tea as a peppermint decoction, what would end up happening is all those essential oils from the peppermint would, over you know hours, evaporate into the into the uh, atmosphere. And so, if you're cooking it, your house would smell lovely like peppermint, um, but your tea would be bitter because all that would be left would be the flavonoids. 
a little bit of tannins in there and it, and it probably isn't going to taste uh, very good. It'll lose its aromatic properties. So some disadvantages, but definitely great. It's great for polar compounds, great for things like saponins, um, flavonoids. Uh, the exposed heat helps to break down the roots and get the water in there. Um, can make your house smell a little bit bad, so that's one disadvantage. If you know, depending on what you're boiling up, I've gone to Chinatown and got uh, saw a Chinese doctor who gave me a bunch of herbs, and I boiled it when I was a student. And all my roommates complained how bad the house smelled, so I wasn't allowed to to make the uh, the Chinese herbs anymore. So uh, that's just an aside. Now, one thing is that certain herbs contain saponins, and remember, saponins. Um, are both fat soluble and water soluble and so it may be in Chinese medicine the addition of herbs like licorice might help dissolve some of the other terpenoids and and resins that may not otherwise dissolve into water because in Chinese medicine they almost exclusively use decoctions so here we've got some water on the stove I threw some this is Canadian ginseng I threw in there and reluctantly turned on the heat there we go and now i'll let that sit for uh, a few minutes to bring it to a boil now you have to watch it when you're boiling up saponins because watch this so here is the panix after it's been boiling for a little bit see all that frothy liquid at the top that foam oh look at that baby screaming in the background there uh, that frothy liquid is the saponins. And if you're not careful, that can sometimes boil over on you and then put out your flame or uh, just make a mess for you. So with the panics, I let it boil for a while. You can see the liquids goes down. That nice yellow color shows you that you're extracting the phytochemicals. So this is maybe after an hour of simmering or so. And then when it's done, you can see that's my decoction. Now what I've done is I've put it in a mason jar and I'll keep that in the fridge and then that'll last me for a week or so. Uh, and I'll just sort of take that to help boost my energy uh, because my children are depriving me of sleep. <clears throat> so you've got hot water extractions, you've got cold water extractions. Uh, now we're going to start moving to a different solvent altogether. So instead of using water entirely we're going to use either glycerol or alcohol so glycerol if you remember the ratio of oxygen to carbon is about a one-to-one -one ratio which is a lot like uh, sugar has that same ratio <clears throat> so it's a very polar solvent it's it's not a great solvent if you're trying to dissolve uh, you know most compounds we use in herbal medicine, like it's okay, but it's not as it's not as good as alcohol, generally speaking. Okay. The only real advantage over it is that it doesn't contain alcohol. So if you're dealing with someone who's an alcoholic, or for religious re reasons they don't want to consume alcohol, uh, or there's a parent who doesn't want to give alcohol to their kid, um, then I would use a glycerate. My kids they get forty percent alcohol whenever they're sick. I usually dilute it. I'll take the forty percent walk. Uh, 40% alcohol um, and I'll basically dilute it so I might use one dropper full of tincture and I'll add like five dropper fulls of water <coughs> and uh, give them the diluted form of it but I'm not worried that, about them getting a little bit of alcohol it's not really a big deal so the advantage though for those people that are concerned there's no alcohol for all those reasons, reasons I mentioned also it tastes sweet that would be only one reason why some kids won't like the taste of alcohol Glycerol tastes, it almost tastes like sugar. It's very pleasant. So it can take something that's like golden seal that's not the most palatable thing and make it pleasant tasting. Uh, and you will dissolve some of the alco some of the alkaloids in it for sure. Um, but still not my favorite. I, I don't use them very often. I might use them for some kids though. Um, the other disadvantages, because it's not a good as solvent, I mentioned that, uh, it's also more expensive. So glycerates usually are often a little bit more expensive than uh, alcohol uh, extracts. Although I'm sure glycerol is way cheaper than alcohol because it's not taxed. But often when I see them for sale, they tend to be more expensive. 
okay? So not my favorite, I use them a little bit, but not tons. <clears throat> so alcohol extracts, um, we'll go through and we'll discuss these now. So the main one that you use in practice is a tincture. So tinctures you usually use 40% alcohol, but it can vary. Um, the amount of herb that's typically used in a tincture is usually a one to four or a one to five. So what that means is one part herb to four or five parts solvent. And that's in a lot of cases, that's the best you can get just because the volume of the herb, um, it just takes up too much space and it's hard to, to make it any stronger than that by making a classic sort of tincture. Now, there are some things that are, are exceptions to that, but certainly with the leaves and flowers and certain types of roots, depending on how they're cut up, could be challenging. So the basic idea is you add your herbs to alcohol, you seal it up, you shake it periodically, you filter it out, you collect the uh, liquid behind it, and you're good. The main advantage of alcohol is it's partially polar, it's partially non-polar. And so what's great about that is you're dissolving a lot of the phenolic compounds that we desire in the herbs. So your flavonoids, you'll get those, they'll do just great in tinctures. Uh, a lot of the terpenoids you, you will also get in uh, tincture form as well. The alcohol is not quite as good as a, uh, dissolving terpenoids as maybe uh, a non-polar solvent would be, but still does a pretty good job. Um, if you had something that's really resinous, you may actually increase the alcohol content from 30 or 40 percent you might get it up to 60 or 80 percent and you will get more of the active ingredients in there with a higher alcohol content but it's going to taste nasty okay um so the nice thing about tinctures is you can just throw all the herbs in throw the alcohol in shake it up and leave it for a while and it does very little prep for you uh, to make, relatively speaking. Um, for the patient, it's easy for them just to take that one teaspoon of the tincture, uh, assuming they don't mind the taste of it, it's easy for them to take. Um, also, the advantage of once it's in tincture form, those herbs, are, they're going to be good for years on the shelf. Well, if you just had it as a dried herb sitting on the shelf, it may not be good after uh, a year or two, okay? Um... So disadvantages, you've got the alcohol, so all the problems that I mentioned earlier with the alcohol, with alcoholics and children and, and religious reasons. Alcohol is also expensive. Now, you can, as a naturopath, get, uh, I have my license to get them, uh, you have to apply for it, um, but you can get pure 100% alcohol, uh, which is a lot more cost-effective to make tinctures from than using uh, store-bought alcohol or whatever, because you're no longer having to pay as much of the tax on it. Uh, and you can buy it in bulk. So it makes it pretty cost effective to make tinctures that way. Um, but generally speaking, tincture, alcohol is expensive compared to water. Um, another disadvantage is people don't always like the taste of it. So down below, and I often will ask an exam question on that, I might say, if you want to make a one to five tincture, how many grams of herbs do you need in, for per liter of water? Now, just so you know, one gram of water is one mil. So 1,000 mil of water or alcohol is going to be like 40% alcohol is going to be roughly a thousand grams. And so you just divide that by four if you want to have a uh, one to four concentration and divide it by five if you want to have a one to five. So 200 grams of herb to 1,000 grams of alcohol or water is going to give you that one to five ratio, okay? Now, another thing to note is if you ended up trying to make a tincture using, let's say, fresh dandelion roots or fresh peppermint leaves, um, and you use 200 grams of fresh herb, again, as a reminder, your tincture will be diluted significantly because a lot of that herb that you're getting is just by weight as water. So the actual active ingredients will be diluted in a fresh herb compared to a dry herb, okay? So again, add your herb, add your alcohol, filter it off, you got your tincture. 
So now I've got, what we have here is we've got the, uh, this is my material to make a tincture. I've got a 50 gram bag of chamomile. I've got a bottle of vodka and I'll use 250 mils of that. And that'll give me a 50 gram to 250 grams, gives me a one to five chamomile tincture. Now I'll tell you this in advance, because of the flowers, it actually is hard to get it any more concentrated than this because of the volume the flowers takes up. So you'd be better off grinding up the flowers or really packing them down after it's done. How are they going to All right, okay. So what we're going to do, Lexi, is we're going to make some medicine, okay? Okay. Okay, do you want to help me do it? Yeah. Okay, EJ is kind of sick, so he's just going to watch. So I'm going to turn this around. So, okay. <laughs> so now... Okay, put it in there. Okay, don't spill it everywhere. I don't like it. It's okay, keep going. Oh, oh shoot. Okay, close enough. Okay, now take that, take the alcohol over here, the vodka, and take that and now pour it inside there. Okay, pour it in there. Can you get it in? Yeah, heavy. It's heavy? We do need some more way. Yeah, you do need some more. Okay, you know what? Mm -hmm. That's good. We do need some more. Lexi? Okay, I want you to put the lid on the on the on the tincture on the Okay. Medicine. Okay. Tight. Put it on nice and tight. Now give that a little shake. What do you think? So, as my daughter Lexi said, we do need some more alcohol. Just because the flowers are taking up so much volume, it's hard to completely submerge them. So, what we do in that case is try to pack it down as best you could, uh, or like I say, use the ground herb. Now, we're gonna show you another example using fennel. And because fennel is more dense, it's much easier to get a one to five, and you could probably even do a one to two tincture with uh, fennel seeds. So. In this case, I'm just going to do a, you've already seen how it's made once. So my daughter is going to do a quick little example of how she did it here. So we sped it up just because it took her a while. So here we've got the fennel seeds. You throw them in and then you, uh, oh, this, she missed a few there. There you go. And then what we're going to do is add the alcohol to it and eventually she'll get it. There we go. So you add the alcohol. Now, what we want to do is we want to put the lid on it and then we shake it up. Make sure the lid's on, shake it up, good. And what you're going to see is quite quickly the alcohol starts to extract the active compounds from the seeds and now what we got to do is do a filter so we're, we have to filter out the seeds so i'm going to get lexi to help me here okay so lexi can you take that off and now yeah. uh, pour just pour it in there no i want to get that off no 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 just pour it in there please no 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 you have to hold on you ha i need i need you so you don't um, spill it here no stop just pour this into here I'll be real ready, 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 ready. Sorry, what, Lexi? I'll be ready, No, I don't. You need to keep... I'll be ready, No, you need to put this... I'll be ready, Can you pour that in there? So we'll, we'll filter it. Good. Dump them all in there. Get them all in there, Lexi. You're doing great. Hang on. I'm that needs... How? Okay, do you want to get some more in there? Okay, you get them, you get them, yeah, you get them all in there. I think that's pretty good, eh? Here, it'll get some more in it. Okay, let's have a look, Lexi. 
Is it pretty good? Okay, good enough. I will put that in too. Oh. Hold on, hold on. Uh, eventually I filtered it. Now what you can see is we started off with 250 mils of alcohol, but the seeds do absorb some of it, so you do have a loss. Now if I was really being careful and I had time, I appreciate it, I was trying to do this with two kids with me, uh, I lost about 70 mils, uh, which is pretty significant, like about you know 20 some percent of, of what I made. So that's, a, that's not a very good loss, you want to become more efficient. Um, I only let it sit overnight, and you can see how dark the alcohol is, so it's already absorbing a lot of the active phytochemicals in there. And so, um, so if you want to do a better job, you could uh, basically squeeze those seeds, uh, press them down a little bit, and you can get more of the extract out, okay? Okay, Lexi, we're gonna use a funnel. That'll make it easier for us. So now you make sure you get it in there, and we're gonna put it into a dark bottle, good. I think you're doing great. It's gurgly, yeah. And that's how you make a tincture. And as you can see, tinctures are pretty straightforward. Now, with regards to uh, the next type of herbal extract we're gonna do, I, I don't generally make these at home. These are fluid extracts. And these are ones where the concentration is going to be twice as strong as the tinctures, or at least it's starting off with twice as much of the herb as the tinctures, okay? Now, you probably could make a fluid extract being a two to one concentration with the fennel seeds, but you certainly couldn't do it with the chamomile because it's just not concentrated because the because of the volume it takes up. So one of the ways that you can get a fluid extract in a higher concentration um, is you circulate the herbs, kind of like you use a percolator or you create some kind of column where you're constantly flowing the alcohol over uh, the herb material to, to do the extraction, okay? Or another way you might do it is you make your tincture, um, and with a one to four and then you could repeat it and make another one to four extract and you can make it even more concentrated so the main advantage of the fluid extracts is you can people have to take less of a tincture so instead of having to take a teaspoon maybe they only have to take a three quarters of a, of a teaspoon or a half a teaspoon and because alcohol is so expensive the advantage is you don't have to use as much alcohol so it's better for the manufacturer and can be a little bit more cost effective per dose theoretically okay now the disadvantage is going to be a little trickier to make so this may be, not be something you can do at home um, you tend to waste more herb because you're not doing it as, as an efficient extraction so the tinctures might end up wasting more alcohol but in this case you're wasting more herbs so fennel's really cheap so um, who cares if you waste it chamomile is really cheap as a herb so who cares if you do if you waste a little bit of that but you get into herbs like ginseng um, you might end up wasting more of the herb and the reason why I'm saying that there's only salt there's a solvent capacity there's only so many chemicals that will dissolve into a uh, uh, hundred or a, a liter of alcohol and so whether you add in 200 grams or a thousand grams of herb there's a certain point where it's like diminishing returns. It'll plateau out. Not unlike if you've got a cup of coffee and you add one tablespoon of sugar, I would say, or a teaspoon of sugar, it'll all dissolve. A tablespoon of sugar, pretty much all of it's gonna dissolve. But if you add 10 tablespoons of sugar to a coffee, there's a certain point where the coffee doesn't get any sweeter because it's saturated and all that sugar ends up at the bottom. So, um, so it can be a bit of a waste. Uh, usually fluid extracts per bottle, per liter, is gonna be more expensive than per tincture. Um, heat or vacuum can damage, oh. One of the other ways that you could make um, a fluid extract potentially 
is to try to evaporate and reclaim some of the liquid. So if you took uh, your tincture and then under with a little bit of heat and using a vacuum, you could evaporate off some of the alcohol and water to concentrate it that way. That would be another technique to do that. Um, but again, you're losing some of the alcohol, so you might have to top it back up afterwards. And also with the uh, with the heat that's required, it could damage some of the things. So I don't know how every manufacturer makes them, but that, those would be another issues. One thing I want to emphasize is that if you use a tincture and it's a one to five extract, or use a fluid extract that's a one to one, what that means is five times as much herb was used to make the fluid extract than the tincture. That doesn't mean it's five times as strong. And that's going back to the analogy of the coffee cup. Adding five times more sugar doesn't make it the actual coffee itself five times sweeter, you know. Um, there's only so much that the alcohol and water can absorb. So when you want to prescribe that, you got to make sure that you use the dose that's written down for the fluid extract or the one that's written down for the tincture. You don't really, you can't really just take a tincture uh, recommended dose. And if it's a one to five, now you're using a fluid extract, so one to one, you can't just take five mils and divide it by five to give you one mil for the person because it may not necessarily equate to that. So if you look here for one herb, I took this from a book, the tincture, you may use three to five mils and the fluid extracts, you may use 0 0.75 to three mils. So it's not, it's, you're not, you're not able just to entirely divide it by five to get that same ratio. Okay. So again, in this case, you're using a thousand grams of herb, a thousand liters, or sorry, a thousand grams of alcohol. Uh, and actually that gives you a one-to-one -one ratio if I'm using a hundred grams, a thousand grams, a thousand grams. So ignore that. One to two should be say one-to-one. -one. Okay. Now a solid extract, what generally do is they'll do some kind of herbal extract of some sort. They may use alcohol or alcohol and water, or they may even use like a, a non-polar solvent like benzene or something. Um, and what they'll do at, after they've extracted it is then they'll reclaim and evaporate off some of that solvent using vacuum and, and low temperature. Um, kind of like how when people freeze dry and then you get a really, really concentrated solution where you could end up having uh, no solvent or very little solvent left over and a very concentrated herbal product. And so the main advantage of doing that is um, you can put this in capsules and it's very concentrated. Uh, easier for the patient to take. Uh, you, If you're using alcohol, you can reclaim that. You can recollect it and then use it again later on uh, to save money, okay? Uh, disadvantage, it tends to be more processing, so it's more cost-effective. Sometimes things get damaged in the process. Uh, and it's possible that if you're trying to extract, let's say, essential oils, you might actually lose the desired material. So a solid extract of peppermint would not be a good way to do it because you're going to lose those essential oils, okay? So again, you make your fluid extract or whatever kind of extract you're doing, you remove the solvent with a vacuum and some heat, and then you get your concentrated end product here. So four to one is going to be a lot more concentrated than a one to four. Now, one thing that a lot of people are doing now is standardizing their extracts. You can do this with liquids, you can do this with capsules or solid extracts. What it basically means is you go and look on the pill bottle and say it has 3% of curcumin or 5% of quercetin or whatever it may be. And the advantage of that is that you can guarantee that that one precise active ingredient you are getting a certain amount and this is good mainly because for example historically there's been a lot of adulteration of herbs with uh, either the wrong thing or uh, a product says like some kind of ginseng tea but there is like basically no ginseng in it or very very little so it's expensive but you're not really getting any medicinal value out of it uh, so this is one way to ensure that you're getting what 
you're expecting to get. Uh, and it's great because then if you're doing a research study, it's easier to repeat that sort of um, study with, with a, or, or, or if you say, look, a 5% solution of quercetin is good for arthritis, then you could always label the bottle and say, this one has a 5% curcumin in it and so it'll have that desired effect which is good um it also is easier when you're dosing your pills and and selling it and being able to predict what happens and also appreciate that from year to year batch to batch herbal products can change significantly so this is one way to sort of help to ensure that you're getting uh, the right amount of the active ingredients now the main disadvantage of standardizing it is costs money because now you got to send it to a lab and get someone to do it for you and it doesn't always reflect the traditional way of administering the herbs now appreciate if i buy a product that's 99 percent curcumin then i'm probably going to get you know 99 percent of it's going to be curcumin that active ingredient in turmeric but what i'm not getting is other components in the turmeric plant like the essential oils oils which could have a therapeutic effect the carbohydrate component, which has been also shown to have an anti-inflammatory effect. So if I'm getting pure curcumin, then that's great if I, pardon me, if I, if I want pure curcumin, that's great. But there could be some synergy with some of the other compounds in it that would not, uh, would not exist. And so appreciate if I take peppermint tea, it's going to be very different than peppermint essential oil. If I take curcumin, 99% pure, it will be slightly different than taking turmeric powder. And this goes on for a number of different herbs. The other thing is, there's been cases where, for example, St. John's wort, they've used a standardized extract of St. John, John's wort, which is standardized to have 5% hypericin in it. But what's interesting is hypericin is not the main antidepressant compound in St. John's wort. So the hyperforin is the main active ingredient. So that standardized they may have standardized it to the wrong compound and the reason why this could be an issue is in some cases um if your standardized extract was a little low let's say if you wanted to have five percent hypericin and when you checked it, it was only at one percent they could just go and buy pure hypericin and then spike it with that to raise the levels of the hypericin and then they can say with confidence yes our product contains five percent hypericin but that's going to affect the relative amounts of the other phytochemicals in, in the solution. So I don't always like uh, standardization for that particular reason. So it's not a bad thing to standardize, but it's not looking at necessarily, uh, it may not translate to the traditional way of recommending these herbs. And it may not uh, take into account synergistic effects if you're only focusing on one compound, like 99% pure of this thing, or if they're spiking and adding it up. There's another thing that I do like, um, and that's called when they do characterized extracts. And I don't know if this term is catching on or if a lot of people do it, but what they basically do is they take the whole herb extract, they do a traditional extraction, and then they measure it, all the phytochemicals in it. And they may standardize the one compound, but they're not spiking it with um, or supplementing it with with that active compound so here's an example where at the bottom uh, at the bottom you have a 99 percent pure uh backland one of the flavonoids and skullcap product so it may have the same amount as the graph that's shown above there and this is the full spectrum one but appreciate even if they have exactly the same amount of the flat of that one flavonoid there's all these other little peaks that contain other flavonoids that may or may not have therapeutic effects um, that aren't being picked up on this 95% pure one. And so they're similar, but there could be some medicinal effects with a full spectrum extract as opposed to a 99% pure extract. Uh, sorry, I guess at the top one, the top one may not have the same amount of the bioflavonoid in fact it may have even less of it but it has these other compounds so there we go sorry i was looking so I did the comparison there's less of this in the full spectrum but there's more of these guys it's a take home there
So we talked about water, we talked about alcohol, we talked about glycerates. Now we're going to talk about oil extracts and give you a few <coughs> uh, different types of oil extracts. So the first thing we'll talk about is essential oils and they're basically obtained by steam distillation. And so the way they do this is they take the herbs, you throw it in the water, you kind of make like a bit of a decoction with it, you put a little stop cap on it, you boil the water, uh, the peppermint or the leaf material starts to simmer a bit. The steam goes up and out of the flask and then it runs through, if you look on this guy, it travels through this little channel here, which is a tube that has cold water flowing around it to cool the steam down. And what ends up happening is that cold steam uh, starts to precipitate out or uh, starts to um, uh, turn back into liquid again and gets collected down here. So at the bottom you'll have a combination of both steam and essential oils that forms over time will eventually form a biphasic layer and you'll have two, two layers, a water layer and an essential oil la layer that you can then uh, just quickly decant off the water and the oil and then you have your essential oils, okay? Uh, so the main advantage of essential oils is that you're basically concentrating the monoterpenoids, the sesquiterpenoids, uh, phenylpropenes, coumarins, you're getting super, super concentrated that five mils of essential oil is a lot, represents a lot of plant material. So to get that from peppermint, I don't know how much you'd have to have, but it'd probably be like a pounds and pounds of peppermint leaf in order to get five mils of peppermint oil, okay? So the advantage of that is you could just, literally you may only need a few drops of oregano oil or a few drops of peppermint oil to have that therapeutic effect. Um, the other thing is you can then um, add it to a topical preparation. If you're making a cream or a balm and you don't want the water component in it, uh, you can just add a few drops of the essential oil or add it to your shampoo uh, and you get the benefits without the other material in it. It's also very easy to inhale the stuff if you add it to do a steam di uh, distillation. You can add it to a, uh, to a humidifier or to hot water and inhale the vapor. Uh, so lots of good advantages. The main disadvantages is it can be irritating if you get it in your eyes. Uh, essential oils, because they're so concentrated, they can be toxic. For example, wintergreen oil, uh, methyl cyclate, uh, is found in a number of sports cream. And if you're not careful, if you, uh, there have been deaths reported to from at least one person who overdosed, who's a, an American Olympian who was smothering themselves in uh, one of these sport creams that contain uh, wintergreen oil in it. And they absorbed all that wintergreen through the skin. And as a result, methyl cyclate is hard on the kidneys and liver and she basically died of the equivalent of, of an aspirin overdose. Um, so you have to be careful. Um, also, orally, if you took, for example, uh, something like five teaspoons of wormwood tincture would not cause any serious harm. Five teaspoon or five mils or one teaspoon of, of the tincture would cause no harm. Uh, the equivalent volume in an essential oil could cause death because the thuyone in, in wormwood would be concentrated and that's the main neurotoxin in wormwood and that would be you know very, very dangerous. So with kids, I get a little uneasy if these are kicking around because kids might think that they look kind of fun. They're a small vial. They open them up and they chug them back. And if it was clove or wintergreen or something like that, it would be um, toxic. Also, they can be very expensive because it's concentrated. And appreciate the only thing that should be in the essential oils are compounds that are like 5 to 15 carbon in size. Um, you're not going to get flavonoids in there. You're not going to get triterpenoids and other larger compounds, okay? If your essential oil is not colorless, chances are it's been adulterated with something uh, because all essential oils are colorless because of the size of the molecules. Another thing is if an essential oil is pure, put a dab on a piece of paper, take your hair dryer, blow it. If it all evaporates away, it's pure. If it leaves a residue, and no matter how much heat you apply, it just you can't get rid of that residue, 
then it's been adulterated with some other kind of carrier oil like olive oil or almond oil or, or something else so it's not as pure so that would be a way you could dilute it if you wanted to make more money uh and say if you want to dishonestly make more money and and uh, and uh, sell people uh essential oils that aren't actually pure so those are the essential oils now fixed oils are kind of the other end of the spectrum with regards to weight these are really heavy compounds and so a, generally a fixed oil is has a, a glycerol backbone you can see at the bottom this is the same glycerol molecule you use when you're making glycerate extracts and then there is fatty acids attached to it okay and fatty acids range anywhere uh well i could range anywhere from like let's say three to uh, 18 carbon or 24 carbon in length uh, but most of the ones of the fixed oils are usually things like oleic acids, about 18 carbons. Um, so olive oil will have three 18 carbon chains stuck to, to a glycerol, basically. So the way that you get things like these fixed oil is they're heavy, so they don't evaporate away. So you can't use steam distillation. Rather, what you do is you apply pressure to the fruit or the nut or the seed and Sometimes a little bit of low heat might be used to facilitate the process, although certain oils you don't want to use heat because it can oxidize it. Um, and eventually what will end up happening is a liquid will come off and then they'll allow it to separate in if there's any water in it. So you might get in some fruit, there may be water and fat in it, so you have to separate it off. Um, you remove the aqueous component, the water component, and you're good to go. So this would be things like olive oil, flaxseed oil, uh, castor bean oil, uh, walnut oil, avocado oil would all be uh, processed that way. Um, no, not a lot of disadvantages. I mean, it depends on what you're trying to do with regards to, uh, let's say one disadvantage I can think of is like with the flaxseed oil, you won't have very high amounts of the lignans in it because the lignans, these are phenolic compounds and they're not really that fat soluble. So flaxseed oil is good for the omega-3 fatty acids, but not so good for the lignans and there will be no mucilage in it. So eating ground flaxseed, for example, you'll get the fiber, you get a good amount of lignans in it from the those polyphenols that are great for preventing prostate cancer and heart disease, yada, yada, yada. Um, and you get the oils in it. But if you have just a tablespoon of the pure oil, it will have a higher concentration of the uh, of the flaxseed oil in it because it's just pure flaxseed oil, but it'll be void of the other components which offer other health benefits. So again, the more you process it, you lose some health benefits in one area, but you could gain other ones in another area. <clears throat> so oil infusions. So oil infusions are basically, you're using something like olive oil or some vegetable oil. Um, you could some, they used to use in the old days like bear fat or pork fat to do certain types of extractions. And so you're using the oil as a solvent. Now olive oil is not going to be as good a solvent as something like turpentine would be if you're trying to extract these nonpolar compounds. Just because olive oil is a larger molecule, uh, the size of the solvent is going to affect to some degree how good a solvent it is. So turpentine is a great is is going to be a superior solvent over olive oil if you're trying to extract these nonpolar compounds um, from a plant. So they're both nonpolar compounds, but because of the size of it, you're going to have to get a slightly different uh, ability for to dissolve these solutes. However, turpentine is poisonous, so um, not really something you want to eat. <clears throat> so the advantage of these infused oils is you get your non-polar compounds out. They can be very inexpensive to make, pretty easy to make as well, easy to apply both topically, and you can take them internally. So topically, you might use them in creams and salves and things like that. Internally, you might use it, for example, um, do an extract with olive oil and rosemary and garlic and um, might be something you drizzle on your bread and, and you're getting some cardiovascular benefits from the terpenoids and the essential oils in the rosemary, uh, for example. 
disadvantages, you're not going to get any of the, or very little polyphenols in these infused oils. Um, so you're not going to have great extraction for the, for the polar compounds. So this is going to be used primarily to extract terpenoids. You can also get essential oils will go in this, no problem as well. Uh, but mainly it's going to be the larger terpenoids and maybe some of the phenol compounds, but not a lot of them, okay? So what you do is you basically take your herb, you throw it into a packet, into a jar, you add olive oil, let it sit for a bit, filter it off, and you've got your infused oil. So here I made one for us. So here we got olive oil on the right. You've got calendula flowers, uh, pot marigolds on the right. Those are dried. You don't want to use wet ones. And so here's a little example of what happened. So you just basically take, sped up obviously, you pack the flowers into the glass jar, and then you just pack it down. Because you want to have all the flowers submerged, and then you pour olive oil into it so that all the flowers will be submerged as much as possible. I could probably pack in some more uh, flowers in there and then push down the oil, but that's basically how you make it. Now, I filter it off. I was a little careless when I did it. One of the easiest ways to filter it off is you take cheesecloth and you lay it down and then you put the, pour the oil mixture into it and then you can just squeeze it off that way uh, in the cheesecloth and, and you can get most of your oil back. Calendula flowers aren't that expensive. The olive oil is not that expensive. So even if I lost 20% or 30%, um, I'm not really that concerned because I don't need that much of it. And this is inexpensive to make, but it is pretty expensive to buy. So I've got my infused oil now. And now what I want to do is I can use that directly and apply it to the skin, or I can add it to other types of topical preparations, okay? So the first thing I want to show you is uh, how to make an ointment salve or unjin. Now, these consist primarily of non-polar, or entirely of non-polar compounds. You're using some kind of infused oil. You add a little bit of wax to it and maybe some essential oils to it if you wanted to. And the wax is only being used as, a, as basically as a way to thicken it up and make it harder. And so, the main advantage of this is you can add this, it'll, it basically when you apply a salve to your skin, it creates a bit of a protective barrier. Um, so if there's some kind of damage or irritated tissue, it can kind of help to protect a little bit so it doesn't dry out. Uh, it doesn't penetrate as well as creams do because there's nothing, there's no water soluble component. So it doesn't dissolve certain phenolic compounds like flavonoids that you might want. It's also a bit greasy cosmetically. so. You don't want to go and throw this on your face and then go out on a date. You just look kind of greasy, which isn't really what you want. So for the recipe that I made here, I'll show you a little video. I used the infused calendula oil and then uh, one or two, uh, so I think I used about a two or three teaspoons of wax to it. The reason why this variation is that depending on how hard the wax is that you're using, how much you're using per grams, how thick you want it. Sometimes people want it a little softer than a little harder, uh, will vary. So if you want it really hard, you add more wax to it. And you can always do little tests as you go as well. So first thing I did, shave some of the wax. I had a chunk of wax, shaved it off with the knife, threw it in. I like to melt it in advance. And then I get my infused oil from my last little experiment that I have. I get a little double boiler. So on the left, I've got my calendula oil. On the right, I've got my wax. <clears throat> and then I take a tablespoon of the wax and I throw it in. My name is a teaspoon. Throw it into uh, the infused oil. Mix it up. Add some essential oils to it. And then when it cools, I have this little salve here. And you can see it's thickened up nicely, but not too thick. Now, I think I got a video uh, with Lexi. Oh no, I don't. I had a video with Lexi. Anyways. Um, lotions and creams. So, a lotion or a cream, it contains both water and oil and a little bit of wax in there. <clears throat> and so this is better as a moisturizer. It penetrates the skin. It's not as greasy look looking. Uh, a little trickier to make though, for sure. Less protective uh, than the ointments, but I'd say uh, 
the big thing is if you're trying to make it yourself, these require a little bit of skill. Um, now as a thickener or a hardener, they often use beeswax. Uh, lanolin's another thing, and then commercially they have other things that they may end up using as well. So here I've got my oil, and now what I've done this time, I've actually made a cup of uh, camel, taken my cup of chamomile tea I made earlier on, and I'm using this as my aqueous component, and I'm adding it to the blender. So you can see, unfortunately, I'm adding it way quicker than I meant to. Um, not the best way to do it, and then I'm blending it up, and so. If you add it in nice and slowly, it'll give it enough time to form like an emulsion. So I made that up, and then when I let it sit, it separated on me. So I was unsuccessful uh, at making a cream uh, because I was just basically adding it in too quickly, and I may have used too much water as well. So I gave another shot. This time, what I did, I grabbed Lexi Sippy Cup, and you can see here when I added the water, I just let it drip in, okay? And I also use a little bit less water to than what the actual recipe had given me. They said to use equal parts, and I use significantly less. And then you can see, this time, I had success. I made this nice little emulsion. It's kind of like a mayonnaise-y like consistency. So that's a cream, still a little oilier than probably a lot of moisturizers are, but I was pretty proud of myself that that uh, turned out there. Now you can see on the left the cream and then on the right you can see the salad. There's just a different kind of consistency to it and this hasn't separated out. So one has the water and the other one has just oil and wax. So you can use these, you can apply these creams directly to your skin. Um, and that's one way of applying herbs. You can use the salve or the creams. Now, another way you can add things, apply herbs topically to your skin is using a fomentation. Now, fomentation, the advantage of this is you don't have to uh, apply, like if someone had like an open wound or a burn and it was very sensitive to touch, it's hard to apply a salve or, or a cream directly to it sometimes. So one of the ways that you could do is a fomentation. And so what you're doing in this case is you're taking gauze or some kind of bandage or cloth and you're dipping it in a solution of herbs. And it could be a basically tea that you've made up or you might be like an arnica tincture that where you add like say a tablespoon of the tincture to some water and then you dip the bandage in that and then you wrap it around the effective area. So it's less expensive. It's also useful because you may not always have let's say a particular cream that you need or kicking around the house so you could just make it up with this and maybe a little easier to apply to very sensitive tissues that don't you know if you if, you, if the patient can't uh, tolerate pressure or or touching it this may be a way to to apply the herbs uh, so I got a little video for you here we go um, get your arm. so what we're gonna do yeah. is we're gonna take the bandage and we're gonna dip it in the tea and now what we're going to do is put your arm down put it down okay and put it over here and now we just wrap it around your hand i need to dye my hand yeah don't worry you could, it's supposed to be wet i need to dye my hand hey i'm not sick daddy i'm gonna hurt myself Okay. Hurt my so what do you think of that, Lexi? Yeah. Okay, so Lexi's not sick uh, and she wants to dry her hand, but um, that's what fomentation, so they're wet bandages that are used to apply uh, the material there. Now another type of preparation where you're basically applying the herbs directly to the, to the injury or to the wound is a poultice. Now a poultice is a type of porridge. Uh, I guess that's what it is in Latin. And so this is where you take the herbs and you kind of make up like a gruel-like consistency to and apply it directly to uh, the affected area. And so you could do like an oatmeal poultice if you had, let's say, itchy skin or some kind of irritation. Um, you could use something like 
I'm showing, I'm showing here a slippery elm poultice or even a bread poultice. And I've had a, I've used a bread poultice uh, on myself. Uh, where they can be good for is drawing pus out of a wound. And I had an abscess on my chin once. That was really, really bad. It was like a small little, basically a little sebaceous cyst that got infected and blew up into this golf ball sized uh, abscess. It was very painful and, uh, and pussy and gross. And so I applied a, a bread poultice and basically took a whole grain bread, dipped it in a little bit of water, put it on my chin and then wrapped gauze around it to hold it in the place. And this golf ball pus filled infection by morning time about probably about 60% of the pus had been drained out of it by the, uh, by the poultice. And so what it basically does is that the bread and all the fiber and everything in it, it acts as a sponge and it helps connect when there's little, what has to have little whiteheads um, on the abscess or the whatever the infection is, but it helps to draw that out. So these poultices, they also use, for example, slippery elm for the same purpose, because slippery elm is rich in fiber and mucilage and it absorbs and kind of acts as a sponge to draw out infection, okay? So uh, typically it's applied warm to the area to increase circulation. Uh, it's pretty inexpensive to do. Obviously, it's a bit messy, uh, and not everybody has faith it's going to do something. I'll give you a little video here of uh, doing a slippery on poultice with Lexi. It's not yucky. Try it. Taste it. That's called slippery elm. What do you think of that? Yeah. Here, do you want to try a spoonful? No. Wait, you don't want to eat that? No. It's cold. It's cold? Yeah. Do you want... Can I put this on your arm? No. As medicine, can I do that? No. Okay, do you want to put it on daddy's arm? You want to put it on daddy's arm? Yeah. Okay, hold on. Okay. So what we're going to do, Lexi, yeah. is... Oh, you already got some on there. So... I already got some. So, Lexi, okay. what we got is we got slippery elm. So now let's put it right up on here, okay? Okay. Okay. And now you hold your hand up like that. Now what daddy's going to do... Yeah. Hold it there. And what daddy's going to do is take this and wrap it around. Hot foam. Why? Yeah. Because it's a way that we can put the herbs on your skin. It went like band-aid. It is a type of band-aid. Yeah, it almost like band-aid. Okay, there you go. But See? I need my daughter Ma a whole eye. So there's a poultice. Uh, next one we're going to talk about are liniments. So liniments, these are going to be your sport creams or sport oils. What they are is you basically have some type of solvent that's uh, rich in essential oils or cream or balms rich in essential oils. And the idea is that you're supposed to apply this to the surface of the skin with a rubbing like using friction. And that helps to um, sort of get the circulation there and all those essential oils and it kind of have uh, a great effect on decreasing inflammation, increasing circulation. So they're pretty useful. The woodlock is kind of a turpentine based uh, Chinese formula where they have all these other like camphor and wintergreen and other essential oils that help have a cooling or a heating effect on the skin. I think everyone's heard of Tiger Bombs and then Rub A535, same sort of thing. More of a cream, a little nicer to apply. Um, so they're great for muscle pain. Uh, you can overdose on it. It contains a lot of uh, wintergreen oils I mentioned earlier on. The main disadvantage is people don't always like the smell. So if they're going to work, they may not want to lather themselves up with these guys and and uh, and uh, you know subject their their colleagues to the to the smell of wintergreen and camphor. Um, Another thing that you could do is baths, so it could be a full body immersion or it could be a localized bath, like a sits bath. 
So some examples is, for example, if you had a lot of eczema or poison ivy or some kind of skin issue, you might want to do an oatmeal bath uh, where you put oatmeal in, let's say, either you grind it up and just throw it into the bath or you um, add oatmeal to like a stocking or some sort so it doesn't get all into your bath and then you just dip it in the hot water and then the mucilage and some of the phenolic compounds uh, just are excreted into the water. Um, if you had hemorrhoids or rectal fissures or some kind of uh, area with, with with the reproductive organs or the or the rectum, you could, or maybe not the rectum, the, the outer area, you might want to apply, uh, do like a sitz bath with witch hazel, so it's very astringent to help with that. Uh, some people will do, for example, cayenne foot baths when they're um, having fighting off a cold, and so you put your feet in hot water with cayenne in it, and the cayenne acts as a rubefacient it increases uh, basically capillaries will dilate and increase the blood flow to the feet to kind of help with circulation so lots of different ways you can do these so essentially you just add the herbs directly into the water and then you bathe whatever body part is so the advantage is people like doing these good for kids um, you could add in certain certain herbs like chamomile uh, into the bath and it can have a bit of a topical uh, healing properties to it and, and kind of calming and it makes the bath a kind of a fun color for the kids. Uh, disadvantage is a bit messy, a little bit of preparation time and you're also not concentrating the herbs uh, that well. So if you're having uh, a bath with a very expensive herb, you're probably wasting the money. But things like oatmeal and witch hazel are pretty inexpensive so it's not a big deal. Now some internal preparations, um, in addition to the ones that we've talked about, you can do ear oil. So you take one of your infused oils like the calendula, one of the things I often will do is use that with uh, a clove of crushed garlic and then they can just mix that up and then just add a few drops to the ear and it's good for uh, ear infections. Um, so that's my go-to. if. Um, before going on antibiotics with uh, ear, chronic ear infections of kids, you remove food intolerances, but acutely you can use something like an ear oil, okay? Uh, another thing you can do is a gargle. So gargles, you make basically uh, a cup of tea, uh, or you might take a tincture and add it to water, and then you just gargle, and that, that would be a great way to um, expose, let's say, the tonsils or some kind of lesion that's in the mouth or the back of the throat to the herbs. And you can either spit the herbs out when you're done or you can swallow the herbs uh, depending on if you want to have those things. So if it's, let's say you had some kind of wound and you wanted to use an astringent herb that you didn't want to swallow, then you could just gargle with it and spit it out. You doing a gargle? Mm-hmm. Okay. Now your turn. Okay. So, pretty good, good, good compliance for things like sore throats, um, um, tonsillitis, for example. Lozenges, these are basically cough drops, okay? So they basically have sugar, a little bit of mucilage often, they throw some herbs in there, some essential oils, um, and then you can walk around with them and pop them when you have a cough or a sore throat. It's a good way of giving local administration of the herbs. So when you're sucking on the cough drop, it kind of dribbles down your throat and it's good that way. Um, disadvantage, it's really only good for sore throats for the most part. So capsules and tablets, this is by far probably the most convenient way to administer herbs. Uh, capsules, uh, basically they're like little containers for dry herbs. Tablets is where they basically take powdered material and they stick them together to make a tablet. Uh, so there's no outer shell on it. They tend to be a little harder. Some people prefer capsules because they're softer, easier to swallow. Uh, there is a belief that capsules are better absorbed than tablets, but um, I don't you'd have to have pretty impaired digestive function not to be able to uh, break down a tablet. But it also depends on what kind of ex um, additives and ex uh, uh, 
compounds that they add into it to, to sort of bulk it up and stuff. So, um, generally speaking, this is kind of what I think a lot of people like to use because there's no taste. And it's easy to take two pills three times a day, much easier than drinking uh, a cup of whatever three times a day. Um, disadvantage, some people don't like pills, so teas and tinctures are preferable. Uh, another disadvantage is you can't taste it. And I think that when you taste something bitter, it often is a better for your digestive tract. Or if you taste a herb, I think on some way, it communicates better to your subconscious to say, look, I'm taking medicine, let's activate the innate ability to heal itself and to feel better. So although I use capsules and tablets frequently, I do think that sometimes taking bad tasting things uh, helps to make you feel better. And it could be the placebo effect, which is not a bad thing, uh, just telling your body that we're doing something about this, better smart enough. Absorption, again, that's debatable. I don't, there's one supplement company that did, did a comparison of their tablets to their liquid extracts, and they found that the active ingredients uh, were both detected in the blood to the same concentrations, whether they're using the liquid tinctures basically or their tablets. So I don't think that applies to everyone. So if you want to make your own capsules, Here's a little example. So you take the little gel caps, you stick them in this, you can do it by hand as well, but you stick them in this little device here. And then what you do is you grab some powdered herb, you sprinkle it up on top, spread it out. And you pack it down once. And then you go and do it again. <clears throat> I would have packed it down a second time, but... And then you go and manually put the little caps on. And basically that's how you can do capsules. Now, obviously, uh, this process has been automated for companies, but some, some supplement companies are actually still doing it that way. So those are capsules you can put in your mouth. Uh, there are suppositories that you can put at the other end if you want. So suppositories are usually used uh, for vaginal infections and insert in the rectum for, let's say, things like proctitis, uh, hemorrhoids in the vaginal area for uh, vaginitis or yeast infections. Um, I often will use boric acid suppositories for difficult vaginal infections. They work just great. And to be honest with you, we usually just make them as a capsule, like the same way I might make the uh, capsules you saw on the previous slide, make them with a gel cap uh, and use the boric acid, and it works fine. Um, these ones are often used kind of like, they'll use an oil, coconut base, a little bit of wax with the herbs mixed into it, and then they'll tend to melt when they're inside the cavity and have like a slow release effect. But you have to buy them from a compounding pharmacist normally they're not as easy to make so I make the boric acid caps myself and they work like a charm uh, but other ones uh, you can compound them yourself one way you can do it is if you take a, a pen and uh, you take some tin foil and you basically wrap the tin foil around it then you can make your own little suppositories for a home so you make your infused oil with a little bit of wax or whatever you want in it with the active ingredient you pour it in and then you put it in the freezer or the fridge and when it cools, it'll solidify, and then you can just pop it into the cavity as needed, so. Other things you can do are enemas. So basically you take a liquid, could be people do coffee enemas, or it could be an astringent uh, enema, and you basically make a tea with, let's say, oak or witch hazel, whatever it is, insert it into the rectum, um, and retain it, and it can have that localized effect there. So the main advantage is, uh, if you were to drink a high concentration of astringent herbs, it would tan your intestines all the way down. So by inserting them in the rectum and having an enema, you could decrease bleeding and help with that localized effect without having it affect the rest of your body. Also, it decreases the absorption of these things um, as well. Main disadvantage is, you know, it's only limited to uh, rectal and colon sort of issues, and a lot of people don't really like animas, uh, so don't really recommend them very often. Uh, 
All right, so we talked about some herbal formulations and different types of preparations you can use for uh, administering herbs to people. Now we're going to talk about just some general herbs that are used uh, externally. And so although um, we're not going to go into a lot of detail, I think it's worth mentioning some of these herbs and I've got some good little uh, illustrations for you to explain them. So there's lots of different topical conditions or skin conditions that you can use herbs for. <clears throat> this is any kind of trauma to the skin that may involve things like burns or cuts or lacerations, uh, but also infections, warts, certain skin conditions as well, muscle pain, arthritis, uh, varicosities, etc. So what I'm going to do is just talk about a number of the herbal actions used for skin conditions. And some of these actions apply also for internal conditions as well. So the first thing we'll talk about is vulnerary. <clears throat> now vulnerary herbs, um, this action I think is kind of unique to herbal medicine. You don't really see this in the pharmacological or in pharmacology as far as I know. Uh, vulnerary herbs are used to speed up the healing of wounds. Uh, it can also um, often be used for chronic conditions like eczema where it can help uh, reduce this, the, uh, the redness and and the cracking and, and have a positive effect that way as well. I would say but a lot of these vulnerary herbs seem to have anti-inflammatory effects as well and if, appreciate that the inflammatory response in the body uh, is stimulated when there's some kind of trauma to, to tissue, soft tissues in the body. So if you twist your ankle, um, you know, there's a lot of inflammation and swelling. And one of the problems is, is that um, too much inflammation uh, sometimes it, it gets your body is overexcited, and uh, the inflammatory process, although it can help heal things, um, it also has destructive effects because the body gets confused and maybe it's fighting off an infection, not that the tissue has been damaged. So sometimes using vulnerary herbs and anti-inflammatory herbs, or, or even things like ice, just helps to modulate or dampen the inflammatory response, uh, so it's not overly destructive and when it comes to vulnerary herbs a lot of these appear to modulate inflammation so I wouldn't say that they're fully anti-inflammatories uh, entirely they're probably balancing things to some degree so um, most of these vulnerary herbs um, would be used acutely for wounds but also for ulcers that are you know more chronic um, a lot of the tissue things that you'd use it for is soft tissue things burns uh, cuts bruises, uh, leg ulcers, eczema, and also hard tissues. If you broke up your ankle or sprained a tendon, you could use vulnerary herbs as well to help speed up the recovery time. Now the action of vulnerary is not uh, exclusive to just topical use. Uh, we use vulnerary herbs internally for things like stomach ulcers or other kind of uh, irritation and inflammation of the, vulnerary, or the um, uh, gastrointestinal tract. So there are certain herbs that you can use both internally and externally um, as vulnerables. And so a herb like marigold, it's a classic herb used for, I would say for sunburns and for to help uh, speed up the healing of cuts and, uh, and also topically for ulcers. Uh, internally, it's also been used uh, for stomach ulcers as well. There are some types of inflammatory issues of the gut uh, where maybe there is like ulcerative colitis, you could use it in a formula. Um, I usually use it more topically in cream. So when I made up the, the salves, the infused oils, I use marigold as a vulnerary. So that infused salve, I might use it topically for something like sunburns or maybe uh, for eczema. Um, so there's a couple examples. Chamomile is a great herb in traditional herbal medicine. Um, it's commonly used for stomach irritation, stomach ulcers. It's also used for uh, children with colic and irritation. Uh, but it appears to have uh, a vulnerable property and helps speed up internally uh, for stomach ulcers and, and things like gastritis or inflammation of the stomach. So it can be used internally to help for someone who's got a chronic uh, stomach ulcer. You could drink chamomile tea would be totally appropriate. Now the other thing you can do is you can make chamomile tea but instead of drinking it you could do something like a fomentation that I showed you earlier on where you dip gauze in the tea 
and then wrap the affected uh, wound or lesion uh, with the bandage and that way you could get that chamomile directly in contact with the um, uh, with the wound. Um, other herbs like greater plantain, uh, there's a few different varieties of plantain but plantag plantago major is one of the ones that would be used um, First Nations people would chew up the leaf and apply it topically to uh, cuts and, and wounds and also to insect bites um, and it appears to have a, a vulnerary effect. So those, all those three herbs, you could take it internally or apply it topically if you wanted to and they're all safe. Uh, I have no concerns with any of those. Now there are certain vulnerary herbs that are specific for external use. Arnica uh, is the classic remedy for bruising. So anyone who has, um, let's say, uh, a lot of, uh, they, there's some kind of blunt trauma has occurred or they've twisted an ankle. So where the skin isn't exposed and there's a lot of bruising in the area, then Arnica is a great remedy for that. Now, uh, there are studies that show arnica has been maybe beneficial for other things like low back pain and arthritis. Um, and so in addition to having this vulnerary effect, it also has a anti-inflammatory effect. Um, so arnica is great. The problem with it is that internally it's toxic. And so you can't drink this internally. Now, some uh, old school herbalists would use it in minute doses for certain types of conditions. But as far, far as I'm concerned, it's just not necessary to use this. Um, now another herb, which is a little bit more controversial, whether it can be used internally or not, is comfrey. And we'll talk about comfrey, and maybe I've already talked about it already. Um, it contains pyrolizidine alkaloids that make it potentially toxic to the liver. Now, traditional herbalists use comfrey both internally and, and externally as a vulnerary. Uh, there's some astringent properties to it. There's mucilage in there. It can be used internally for uh, stomach ulcers to help speed up the ulcers. Um, but because of the pyrolizidine alkaloids and because Health Canada says it's not allowed to be used internally, it's probably best to, to avoid that. Um, the risk is probably relatively small, but um, the fact that the government's saying not to do it, I'm going to stick to that. Now, Comfrey has another name called knit bone, and that name basically it was used to heal uh, broken bones. Um, so you can tell just by that other common name that it does have that affinity for joints now, um, or to, to bones. So if someone had broken a bone, it could be applied around the area, and, and it may hasten the spilling of the of the fracture. Also. Um, Homeopathically, it was used traditionally for the same indications. Um, with comfrey, there's also research studies showing that there's benefit for it for uh, applying it topically for um, uh, arthritis in the hands and, and knees and other places. So a lot of these guys, in addition to having this vulnerary effect, there's that anti-inflammatory effect as well. So there is marigold on the left and chamomile on the right. You can see they both belong to the Asteraceae family, which is that classic daisy looking flower. Um, the Probably the main compounds in the marigold that have a vulnerary effect are the triterpenoids that are in there. So they're fat soluble components. That's why we're using olive oil as a, as a solvent. Chamomile has various flavonoids and some sesquiterpene lactones that are somewhat somewhat or relatively uh, soluble in water. So that's why you can use it as a tea. The marigold probably you making like a tea with the marigold and doing a fomentation i'm not sure if that would be as effective um, necessarily as the chamomile would be arnica uh, it too is in the same family as the other two uh, as the calendula and the and the, mar and the um, chamomile um, again this is only for external use and the comfrey again somewhat controversial debatable uh, I would be inclined just to use it uh, externally though. Now, if you have this growing, it's a very, um, if you ever decide to plant in your garden, it kind of takes over. It's a very invasive plant, uh, but it creates these beautiful, big, uh, quite large leaves. Some of them can be one to well over a foot long. And uh, one of the things that you can do is you can use it as a poultice, or not as a poultice, as a, uh, uh, sorry, yeah, as a poultice. You could steam the leaves 
uh, even though it doesn't turn into a porch, you could steam the leaves and then just apply the raw leaves to the damaged uh, body part and apply it that way. Or you could do an extract, um, like an infused oil, or take a little bit of a tincture and add it to water and apply it with some gauze. Um, and there's so there's different ways that you can apply it. So it can be both use the fresh leaves, can be steamed and applied directly to it, or you can do some sort of extract and, and apply it that way as well. So comfrey is um, commonly seen in a lot of skincare products uh, for that vulnerary effect. Now we've talked about astringent herbs already. Astringents can be used both internally and externally. And the ma main way that they work is they uh, form uh, a cross-linking with the proteins, with the damaged tissues, and kind of draw them together. And by doing that, they kind of create a second layer of skin uh, that can uh, arrest bleeding and also uh, make that damaged area less susceptible to infection uh, and also physical trauma. There's a related term called a styptic, and a styptic is basically an astringent compound that arrests bleeding. So it's a pretty strong astringent. So uh, you can buy, for example, styptic sticks at the uh, drugstore, which is usually a chemical like aluminum hydroxide, I think is they're, what they're often made from. Uh, but you could use herbs as well, like oak, uh, witch hazel, and uh, so if you cut yourself shaving, you apply that to it, to it, and those astringent sort of compounds uh, help to sort of tighten up the skin and uh, and stop the bleeding. And so a lot of the um, um, aftershave toners and things like that, they contain alcohol, and some of them will contain oak or witch hazel and it'll help to kind of any kind of irritation that kind of decreases that and, and reduces the inflammation and stops bleeding. So astringents would be used primarily for wound healing both internally and externally uh, for ulcers and by applying it topically you kind of um, you protect that ulcer and give it an opportunity for the deeper tissues to heal. Um, with eczema you want to treat the underlying cause of the eczema which is usually related to a food intolerance but if it's really severe and it's cracking and the skin's red and inflamed you could apply an astringent topically just to sort of uh give a little bit better protection to to those cracks and to kind of give an opportunity for them to heal up uh other types of inflamed skin conditions it can be beneficial uh varicose veins because they can be very painful so it can help to draw them in a little bit by applying it topically and then internally you'd use it for something like diarrhea um, and uh, because it'll work on the mucous membranes and have an astringent effect on that and we'll talk about more regarding the internal use of these later on so witch hazel oak these are both very strong astringent agents uh, rich in hydrolyzable tannins those are the main compounds that have that effect that you're looking for um, here i think this oak plant here is a red oak i believe but there's a whole bunch of different species there's black oak white oak red oak maybe it's white oak no it's oak tree i don't know which species it was um so most oak species are rich in those hydrolyzable tannins um and any of them would be probably uh effective so another term is something called anti-ulcer or anti-ulcerogenic um, those two terms can be used interchangeably. Some books use one, some books use the other. These terms are often associated with herbs that have an astringent or vulnerary effect. Now, uh, not all anti-ulcers herbs are astringent. Uh, for example, chamomile, I wouldn't really consider it to be very astringent, but it does have a vulnerary effect. And things like oak, I don't really consider it to be a vulnerary. So again, most astringents and vulnerary herbs have an anti-ulcer effect, even if it's not listed, but not all anti-ulcers have both of those actions. And these can be used both internally and externally, mainly for uh, ulcers uh, that aren't healing. And so one of the problems with an ulcer is if there's some kind of trauma or something's going on with the skin, let's say... Um, for whatever reason there's constant rubbing on the area or if there's uh, a problem like with venous ulcers where uh, because there's a lot of swelling in the legs and poor circulation the surface can't get the proper nutrients and it constantly is dying off and not able to, uh, to sort of heal 
um, these things can be used to provide a protective barrier to allow those ulcers to heal so they don't get infected and cause problems, okay? So, this is a herb um, from the Amazon. It's called Dragon's Blood, uh, Croton Lechery. Now, be careful because there's different plants around the world that have the same name, Dragon's Blood, but this is the one from Central and South America. And this is one that I've used on uh, a patient um, when I was, I've gone down to the Amazon a number of times. When I come back, I've brought back the, the Dragon's Blood and used it for patients. Here's someone who I have on the right. He's got uh, venous insufficiency. So he's, his valves and his legs are all messed up. And uh, he gets these ulcers come up in various places on the legs. They'll appear for a period of time. They look very raw. They're, I think they're painful. They look, certainly look painful. Um, and the medical doctors can't really do a whole lot for them. And... Uh, so for this, I use dragon's blood. And dragon's blood, it's an interesting herb. Um, it contains both astringent and vulnerary properties to it. And when you take that latex, that's a latex, it's a aqueous uh, compound. And what it contains is a combination of tannins. There's a couple of little alkal, like in this weird little compound that's part tannin, part alkaloid. And when you apply that topically to the skin, literally, like you just take it right off the tree, and that's how they, they sell it. And you apply it to the lesion you'll see within seconds it it forms that cross-linking and just seals it up really really well and so this patient i would give it to him and he would get uh he would find that his ulcers would heal uh, you know, significantly faster with this and it would reduce the infection you can you can see there that second layer of skin that this has formed and uh and he thought this stuff was miraculous. So although it didn't cure his ulcers, it gave him a way to manage them better uh, than what the conventional system was offering. Um, this isn't really very easy commercially available to find in Canada yet. I'm sure eventually it will be. Um, but let's say you don't have dragon's blood, fair enough. Then you could use maybe a mixture of, like if you used a, a tea that, or not a tea, a, a tincture that had maybe an astringent herb like oak or calendula in it maybe you could kind of mimic that behavior by providing a vulnerary and astringent herb to help with that so, th so that'd be another way but this stuff is this is a great herb uh and it's it's pretty remarkable to see uh the before and after photos and that's like i said within seconds it just stops oozing and, and seals it up this herb is also used internally for various types of diarrhea and infectious diarrhea so it's a, it's a neat compound and that red color that you see in there those are the proanthocyanins or the anthocyanins uh, give it that nice red color. Now another herbal action um, is that's used specifically for skin is escoriatic. So an escar in Latin or Greek refers to a scab. So this is a herb that forms scabs. And what it basically is, um, it's a herb that's that's basically burns. It's, it provide it creates a chemical burn that literally burns the skin. And destroys the skin and uh, some of these do it through inhibiting mitosis some of them do it through other mechanisms um, but they're pretty powerful and you have to be very respectful there is traditional salves like the black salves that used escoriatic herbs um, and some other compounds as well that were applied topically for things like skin cancer and also even for to remove uh, tumors in the breast and so they'd apply this and it would literally burn a hole through the skin and perform like a chemical surgery and remove the tumors and so I've read about cases of it being used for breast cancer I know some naturopaths have used it um, I personally I would just tell the person to go and get uh, surgery because it's a bit unpredictable how these guys would would, would work now I have used them um, and I do use them for people with for example topical warts um, and so I would use it for warts I had a colleague who had a very large patch of skin cancer that they wouldn't do surgery on because it was so wide it was a squamous cell cancer uh, it was probably I think it was about five or six inches in diameter and so they wanted to go through chemotherapy to get rid of it he didn't want to do that he's in his 20s I think at the time or maybe early 30s and so he used some escoriatic herbs and literally burnt the skin cancer off and uh, and he said it worked uh, doctors were impressed 
but he said it was extremely painful um, taking that much of it and it definitely left some scarring so um, so there's you know there's things you want to be careful with this now escorial herbs ones some of the big ones are bloodroot and mayapple and so bloodroot we've already talked about already it contains isoquinoline alkaloids it's a cousin of golden seal and barberry um, this is a this red latex is rich in has some astringent compounds in there but it also has these isoquinoline alkaloids and so although bloodroot can be taken internally it's a bit caustic and so i don't think i've ever used it internally but i have used it externally and uh early naturopaths and and um, uh, first nations people would take a slice of the roof root and just apply it topically to a skin lesion like a ward or whatever it may be that they want to burn off and just keep reapplying little pieces of it and eventually would burn it off uh, may apple it contains compounds that have an anti um, mitotic effect and so it was once used some of the extracts were used as an anti-cancer drug but it's a bit not sort of it's fallen out of fashion for whatever reason i don't think it's uh, it certainly is effective but maybe there's things with less side effects but topically i've used may apple and formula formulas with blood root um, for treating warts and i've got a little picture here so here's a patient um she came in and when she came in, she'd seen, she was seeing, this is when I was working at Parkdale, and we had a nurse practitioner there who tried to burn this off numerous times with liquid nitrogen and was unsuccessful. And they used, sometimes they'll use, uh, I believe it's salicylic acid as a chemical burn to try to burn it off as well. And it didn't work. So he referred the patient to us, and I made up a little uh, tincture with, it contained um, bloodroot, mayapple, cedar as well which is used for warts it's more of an antiviral and you can see after about a week of treatment it hasn't totally resolved but you can see it's gone down dramatically in that period of time and eventually um, it completely went away after probably a few weeks of treatment so for stubborn warts uh, i've used this uh, on, on, on numerous patients uh, and it seems to work the only challenge is that getting blood root and may apples it's not really commercially available through like a health food store so usually i'm making those preparations from the blood root and the may apple that i gather uh grows grows wild everywhere around here is tons of it uh in in ontario so uh that's how i get it so um there may be some local herbalists who might be able to make a salve up for you and you could make these into salves or as applied as a tincture so i would just get them to take a q-tip dip, dip in the tincture take a band-aid a little bit on the on the uh, uh, on the absorbent part of the band-aid and then just apply it wrap it in the band-aid and leave it on there for the day <clears throat> and at this dose there's not any like significant damage to the skin like there's you know helps it kills off the warp but doesn't actually damage the skin so um Another indication is anodyne. Now, an anodyne is a substance that helps to alleviate pain when applied topically. Now, there are some different, um, you look up some of these definitions. Sometimes it, some books will just say it alleviates pain. It doesn't specify topically. But as far as I'm concerned, it usually refers to uh, a topical application uh, to help alleviate pain. So another term might be a topical analgesic. And so where these would be used is for conditions like muscle pain, which is myalgia, or arthritis, so pains in the joint, or neuropathies, so uh, nerve pains. And so these would be useful nerve pains. People get them if they're diabetic or if they have uh, some of the side effects from HIV medication will cause neuropathies. Uh, or also just damage to, uh, to the ner physical damage to the nerve can cause uh, neuropathies. And so... These guys work by a few different mechanisms. Um, the essential oils from like peppermint, wintergreen, camphor, eucalyptus are often found uh, in various preparations that are used topically for muscle pain. So those um, uh, sport creams we talked about, about earlier on, they may not have the pure peppermint oil. They may actually have just the menthol, uh, the camphor, those compounds but they originally came from these essential oils so they may they're probably using a synthetic version and a way that a lot of these anodynes work is they bind to hot 
and cold receptors in your skin. So if you apply like, if you eat cayenne peppers, for example, uh, it tastes hot, like it feels like it's burning your mouth. It isn't burning your mouth, it's actually binding to certain receptors called terp v one receptors, which are uh, supposed to detect temperature changes and like heat. So if you uh, burn yourself on a stove, that's gonna be, or you get your, you're holding on to something really hot, it's gonna be stimulating these, these receptors. But another way you can stimulate them is by applying a chemical that interacts with those receptors to have that effect. So certain pungent herbs like cayenne, uh, clove, ginger, camphor, they all have this spiciness to them. They all have kind of have a warming effect. And that's one of the, the, the ways that they do it. They bind to these receptors. There's cold receptors in the body as well. So when you have like a peppermint and your mouth feels all cold and, and, and minty fresh, uh, that cold, it's not actually making your mouth cold. It's just making you think your mouth is cold. So it's deceiving you, okay? And so eucalyptol, uh, camphor, uh, also binds to those receptors. And the way that they can have a pain relieving effect is your brain can only take so many pain messages at a time. And so if you've got like, uh, let's say if, if, uh, if you hurt your arm, often instinctively a lot of people will start to rub it or will apply ice to it. And, uh, or if you got something that's itching you, uh, I remember when I was a kid when we used to get stinging nettles on our legs when we were out playing outdoors in the forest. We used to go on and um, uh, submerge our legs in like ice cold streams from, from the mountains uh, where we were playing and it would numb the, 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 our legs so that we couldn't feel the itch. So it's not actually getting rid of the itch. It's just overriding the itch sensation or the pain sensation with a temperature sensation. So when you apply a sport cream topically, there's a few ways that it works, but one of the ways that it works is it basically stimulates these hot or cold receptors. And by doing that, it blocks the entry of the pain receptors, uh, the pain sensation from going into your brain. So it's kind of like if someone's talking to you and you don't want to listen to them, uh, instead of getting them to, uh, to stop talking, you can just turn the volume up on the radio and drown them out. And so that's literally what some of these anodynes do that bind to these hot and cold receptors is that they just drown out the pain sensation with their hot or cold sensation. Okay. Um, and so if you've got nerve pain, muscle pain, uh, even arthritic pain, sometimes these things are effective for, uh, relieving the pain just as a distraction. So wintergreen, not shown on the left there, most of the preparations don't actually use wintergreen. They use methyl salicyclate, which is the active ingredient in wintergreen, which is uh, a cousin of aspirin. Uh, and that wintergreen gives it that wintergreen taste when you have like gum or mints that have a wintergreen uh, taste. It originally comes from these compounds here. So that has uh, also has anti-inflammatory effects, but it stimulates those cold receptors. Camphor uh, kind of works on both hot and cold receptors. You'll find in a lot of the, uh, I always remember smelling it as a kid and I kind of associated with Asia because uh, friends of the family lived in Singapore and they had various creams and, and things like Tiger Balm that uh, were rich in camphor. Uh, eucalyptol, which comes from eucalyptus, and menthol that comes from peppermint. These are both monoterpenes or monoterpenoids, uh, part of the essential oils of these two plants. And you'll often find them in uh, various topical preparations for pain. So a couple more terms that are kind of related to the, um, the anodyne are rubifacients and counter irritants. So a rubifacient what it basically does is it makes the skin turn red. And so if you apply cayenne topically to your skin or some of these essential oils that are found in a lot of these sport creams, the skin kind of will become red. And what it's doing is these essential oils or these compounds, they're irritating and they help to cause the capillaries to dilate and increase blood flow to the area. And so these would be used for muscle pain and also for uh, arthritis and so the, in some traditions they would use for example a cayenne plaster where they would be some type of pre preparation that contains cayenne would be applied often a little um, i've seen them in chinatown where they have these little uh, small um, sheets of some kind of material that's impregnated or embedded with um, uh, 
uh, cayenne and it's applied to the low back and it helps to get blood flow to the area and decrease pain um, and so that cayenne makes it red essential oils in general tend to be irritating and cause capillary dilation so when you take them internally and they help with dilash, uh, digestion uh, and help with the absorption of things one of the reasons why is they act as a rubefacient internally as well where they're increasing blood flow to that area in your digestive tract but you don't see it but topically um, some of these essential oils will have that effect now this term rubefacient is kind of related to a counter irritant uh, a counter irritant is kind of like the anodyne that i just talked about where it's irritating the skin you know by stimulating the hot or cold receptors to decrease the perception of pain and so again these are used for the same things these are all kind of in a lot of ways like some of the herbs that are uh, an anodyne will also be a counter irritant and probably a rubefacient as well okay uh one thing that you can use these guys for as well is uh like a mosquito bite so the reason why you scratch a mosquito oh actually i'm going to talk about that in a second but one of the reasons why you scratch a mosquito bite is because it's itching you and the itch is bugging you and by scratching it you're overriding the itch sensation with the scratch sensation so you no longer feel it you can also apply certain essential oils or tiger balm or or sport creams uh topically to it and it can override that itch sensation from the mosquito bite with a with a essential oil that you know like peppermint or eucalyptus or whatever it may be the other thing with a lot of these just as an aside a lot of these uh, volatile oils um mosquitoes don't like them so in addition to helping relieve the pain you may help to deter them and certainly certain essential oils are more effective at that than other ones but you've probably heard of citronella or citronella um, that particular essential oil in that uh, deters a lot of uh, mosquitoes um, which is a segue for antipyritic so antipyritic refers to a substance that decreases the itch sensation <clears throat> okay and so you can get itching from mosquito bites you can get it from skin conditions like eczema can be itchy uh, sometimes the body releases histamine uh, so if you eat a, have a food intolerance or some other type of reaction that histamine release causes hives and those hives can cause uh, the skin to become itchy and so using herbs like uh, topically you can use oatmeal for example so literally you can make take oatmeal add water to a blend it in a blender or take oatmeal porridge and apply it topically if you had some type of skin condition like eczema or um, some other kind of itchy skin condition and it has specific compounds in addition to the demulsant effect of the fiber that's in it it contains compounds that are it's a type of phenolic compound that actually appears to inhibit uh the itch sensation and maybe it's working on histamine i'm not sure exactly so that's why you find uh certain moisturizing creams will have oatmeal extract in it because it has this phytochemical that has a beneficial effect uh, and as I mentioned earlier, the essential oils through a different mechanism, uh, they probably don't inhibit any uh, inhibit histamine, but they probably just do it through the counter irritant effect, can help decrease pain uh, and itchiness. And uh, that's an antipyritic. So I think we're done with the topical formulations. I hope you guys enjoyed the recording, and we'll see you again soon. Okay, bye for now.